Welcome to the Living History Podcast. I'm your host, Matt McLaughlin, and today we're talking about 1918 and specifically that last 100 days of the war, which really ended the First World War, a a really important time in not just Australian military history, but military history in general. We're going to be talking to Will Davies, a historian who's written some very popular books about the First World War, and that's coming up very soon. Thank you to everyone who responded to our podcast last week, speaking with Aaron Pegram about his new book on the Victoria Cross. Some absolutely incredible stories from Aaron about these men who have won the highest honour you can win in the British and Commonwealth Defence Forces, and I'm really looking forward to seeing that book when it comes out next year. In the meantime, let's talk about 1918 with our guest today, Will Davies. I'm Matt McLaughlin. This is Living History. A state which will live in infamy. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terror attack. This was their final terror. Will, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Matt. So the new book that's coming up, uh, we're going to talk about 1918, in my opinion, the most important year in military history for Australia. Um, Really exciting that coming up to the centenary of these great battles, uh, there's a new book coming out on it. I'm sure it's going to be uh, fantastic. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, Before we get into that, let's let's talk a little bit about you. I mean, you had a long career in TV and and film work. Tell us a bit about that. Well, I started really after graduating in 1971 and I went into the film industry into the documentary side of production. I had a production company for 35 years making mainly history documentaries, which is uh, odd because at the time history was very an unpopular topic on television and very little history was made. So I really closed and retired from that in 2010 And the object was I'd started writing books in about 2002, and they were accidental, in fact. They went from a series I did for SBS called Tales from a Suitcase, and I wrote two, really, or co-wrote two books that were just an edit of the transcripts of these uh, migrant experiences. And out of that came a third book, which was about a particular Afghan Mujahideen fighter that uh, when I came to write his write up his transcript into the Tales book, there seemed like a bigger story. So I went to him and I said, um, look, Abdullah, you know, you should really write a book about your life. And he said, well, I can't write a book. Can you write it for me? So I then went down to Melbourne and lived down there for a while and... Um, recorded each day this sort of difficult conversation with this guy and started writing it up. And the problem was he, I, I, to be honest, I didn't believe a lot of or some of the things he told me. And I had the problem of not being able to prove what he said. There's no documents, no, you know, there's nothing out of that war from the Mujahideen in terms of the sort of documentation that we know of today. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't generally great record keepers no, during, they weren't. That, during that conflict. <laughs> well, they yeah. were illiterate, to put it mildly. So many of them. So uh, I, I, I then started writing the book in the first person, uh, in, the, in the third person, and then I realised I had this problem of his stories that I didn't quite believe. So I resolved it by putting his stories in italics and my story, my third person in, you know, straight font. So, but that became a, an interesting book. And just funnily enough, recently I, I was looking for the publication date of that online and it's called Fighting Masud's War. And I saw on eBay that book advertised for $1,750 because it was, quote, signed by the author, signed by a chariot, the subject, and it had a bookmark, an original bookmark. So I thought, beauty, my books are $1,750. I didn't realise that we'd already (laughs) reached the stage where you uh, had had entered the collectibles market. That's incredible. That's uh, really well done to see. And 
I, I suppose that background in this, in the documentaries, in, in writing these original books, led to your passion for the military history, which you've really now focused on and made That's your own. That's right. I, I mean, as a graduate historian, history's been a really big part of my life. So shifting sideways to military history, I first went to Pozier in about 93 or 94. It was soon after the uh, unknown soldier was interned in Canberra. And I was strangely affected by it. And I took a weekend off and I went from London and drove around like a mad thing. I had John Laffin's guidebook. I, I really didn't know what I was seeing. And, and Possier was a particular case because there it was a major battle, but there's nothing there to show where anything happened apart from the Australian Memorial and the, and the windmill. So that put me on a course of, of, uh, of, of learning and studying and reading. And... Um, I was then asked in 98 to write, um, develop a, a driving tour between Villas Bretonneau and La Hamel for the 98th anniversary of, or this was the 80th anniversary of the end of the war that every nation was, the allied nation was asked to declare a day. We declared the 4th of July. So I developed this uh, driving tour. I studied Hamel. I went to, um, I finished up and wrote a 40 minute radio play which uh, may be something you could even put on for the podcast. Um, uh, I wrote a little book about it, and even today there's these little numbers around. You see one at Adelaide Cemetery with three on it, which is part of my driving tour. I remember that. I did that tour myself. It's funny you mentioned John Laffin's guidebook, Mm. which I think in these days is, uh, you know, people have potentially moved a little bit away from Laffin and and, and the work that he was doing, but... Um, I was the same. My first trip to the battlefields in 2002, I, I um, used Laffin's guidebook mm. and I did your tour. I didn't realise at the time <laughs> whose tour I was doing, yeah. but I did the driving tour of Villas Bretonneau mm. and Hamel and mm. it's fantastic. And um, every time I go to Hamel now and every time I go to Villas Bretonneau, people always ask me, what are these little signs with the, uh, with the rising sun yeah, symbol yeah, on yeah, them? Yeah. So the work that you've done, probably the thing you're most famous for is Somme Mud, the, yeah. the, the book that you wrote. Mm. Um, it's a fascinating story. I edited. I'm very That's conscious a, of that. <laughs> very, sorry, very true, very true. Um, tell us about Somme Mud because it's such a fantastic story. It is a, an unbelievable story and and um, it really started with, it, it was written in the late 20s by Private Edward Lynch. He was a 40th Battalion guy. He came back uh, in 1919. He was a young school teacher. He had about six kids and he worked in remote schools in Tumbarumba and down in, you know, the Snowy. And and uh, in the late 20s, he wrote this book called Some Mud in 20 school exercise books in pencil. And these he typed up. He had some sort of desk job in the Second World War. He had plenty of time, so he typed up the whole book, and it was 185,000 words, so it's a big manuscript. And this was given to me by his grandson, Mike Lynch, who's an old, old and dear friend. And one day he came up and he sort of had this big tome in his hand, double, you know, like two-hander, this one. It's about three inches thick and leather-bound. He said, mate, you like all this First World War shit? Have a read of this. So I started reading and very quickly went, wow, this is something special. So I sent it down to Bill Gamage at ANU, who wrote the uh, the wonderful book, The Broken Years, and an old mate from ANU days. And he said, mate, I read one of these a month, but this is Australia's All Quiet on the Western Front. So that was a pretty good start to let's get it published. So I went to Lothian in Melbourne, my publisher, and they wanted they wanted it reduced to about 80,000 words from 185. And I said, too hard. So I went then to, I had a contact, I'd, I'd, I'd been to Roland Perry's launch of uh, his Monash book and I'd met a lady from Random House. So I got onto her and they very, oh, no, actually before that I went to Harper Collins and they knocked it back. So then I went to uh, Jane Paul Freeman who was then at um, Random House and Random House published it. Now the original idea I had was not a, to, I had to get it down, they wanted 100,000 words. Um, and then finally agreed at 120,000. Um, and I started, I, was, I, I liked the idea that, uh, that uh, uh, who wrote uh, True Story of the Kelly Gang? Um, Peter, um, can't think. Uh, 
And he, he wrote these wonderful little introductory half-page bits. You know, the paper that, you know, this was written on came from the Geraldry Courthouse, you know, like really terrific little vignettes of, of contextual history. I thought, I'll do that because this book had no context. A lot of places weren't mentioned. There were no dates. And I, I felt I needed to say, look, we're now in, you know, June 1917, it's about to be the Battle of Messine and Lynch is here and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I was adding words and I really had to subtract words. So that transformed into a, a follow-up book for Sol Mudd called In the Footsteps of Private Lynch, which is a contextual history of Sol Mudd. So every chapter in the, the Footsteps book is the same chapter title as the other books. So that was... Um, that that did well. Some mud, I think. Some mud now is up to about a hundred thousand copies. So, wow! So it's a sizable book. It did very very well in England, and you know you see it referenced in you know reading lists everywhere. Um. So then I was asked to write the book for the film Beneath Hill Sixty. And I remember going, I was driving, actually, I was driving home from the dawn service in the in Martin Place, and uh, I got this call saying, can you, um, would you be interested in writing this book? I said, how long have I got? And they said, oh, 20 weeks. So, like, 20, 20 weeks, weeks. 20 weeks. 20 weeks. I can't even form an idea for a book in 20 <laughs> weeks, let alone write it. So, 20 weeks I had. In, in the end, I had about 22 but I, was, I had no research. I didn't know anything about the Australian tunnelling companies. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I delivered that on time. I had to. I worked out, you know, 100,000, you know, I work on 20 chapters of 5,000 words. So 100,000 words, I've got 20 chapters, 20 weeks, 5,000 words. That's 1,000 words a day, every day for 20 weeks. That's a big call. Anyway, it's I, I delivered that. Um, then I... In my, in fact, in my research for the uh, the Hamill driving tour, I'd read the uh, the history of the Thirteenth um, Battalion because they were a big part. They were on the on the on, on the on the right, really the extreme right of the attack, going up round Vere Wood. And uh, in the front, it said, uh, you know, to our, you know, glorious Colonel, you know, shido shido. And to our young colonel, Douglas Gray Marks, who, after glorious war service, was uh, lost in the surf at Palm Beach trying to save a woman from the undertow. And I thought, shit, that's, you know, who's this guy? So I quietly filed that, and, and then I, so I wrote the book, The Boy Colonel. And that was about Douglas Marks and his 13th Battalion. And he was a great mate, as you'd know, of, uh, of uh, Harry Murray. And uh, there's one quick story about he and Harry Murray. When they first went to the, the nursery areas around Armitage, Murray and, uh, uh, Murray and uh, Marx went on their own little recce one night. And by this time, Marx would have been a... I don't think he was a captain or a major. No, he wasn't a captain, I don't think, at that time. He might have been. But um, they went on their own little recce. And they went... They crossed the German front trench and they're walking behind the German front trench, along, sneaking along behind the German front trench. And they looked down and they could see these steps going down, you know, into the darkness and there at the bottom is a light and obviously a deep German underground dugout. And halfway down the, the, the steps was a, a landing and uh, by the landing was a hook with a pickle halber, a pointed helmet on it. And Mark said to Murray, I bet you're not going to go down and nick it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Murray, being the mad bastard that he was, goes down and nicks the helmet. And that helmet now hangs on the wall of his son's house in Queensland. Wow. I, I, every story I've ever heard about Harry Murray, who was Australia's <laughs> most decorated soldier. He was the, the Empire's War. most decorated, It's, I think. Recklessly brave. I mean, oh. I, 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 you can't even begin to comprehend the level of craziness and no. bravery that, that no, no, was no, packaged no. up in Harry Murray. Well, I, so. I'm able to. I, I, as you know, I, I go to Goudicourt that no, where no one else goes. But I, I love telling the Stormy Trench history and and winding in Murray and Marx and, and what well, that, that can be. There. The next book can be Murray. Uh, can be Murray in the, Well, Murray's and, been and done Stormy by Fra and, um, George Frankie's already done the book, and he's a lovely, lovely old chap, and I wouldn't like to. 
try and repeat his work. But it's a good, it's a great history. Well, speaking of new books and and recklessly brave characters, it leads us to 1918. Mm. Um, important, we're coming up to the centenary of obviously the the 1918 battles, and this is the last year of the centenaries that have it been going is, on yeah. since yeah, since yeah. 2014. We've been commemorating them. Why don't we, for people who don't know, why don't we? I mean, it's a, it's a long and a complicated series yeah. of battles. Yeah. Why don't you give us your abridged history of of, of exactly what, on, what went on in 1918? <clears throat> okay. We'll begin, I mean, the winter of 1918 saw the Australians mainly up in the Epes sector, around Messine and Plug Street Wood and in that area. And they were at rest, they were just holding a line, there was not a lot of fighting going on. And then the Germans on the 21st of March launched this massive offensive called Operation Michael. Now, the Germans at one end had about 60 divisions Pulled, that pulled out of the Eastern Front with the fall of the Russian, with the Russian Revolution, they get shipped to the Western Front, and the German army now double, effectively, double the uh, the, the British French force, uh, Allied forces. However, so they've got that on their side. The downside is there's about a million Americans about to come ashore and and really change things seriously. So. Soon as the, the uh, soon as the spring offensives were possible, the Germans launched this massive attack. 21st of March, 1918, bulldozed the British back, back over the old battlefields, Pozieres, and right through, took Albert, places they hadn't even taken, and, and really put the British and the French in a difficult position. Now, this is where the importance of Villas Bretno comes in, because the Germans drove along the old Roman road that divided the British army to the north and the French army to the south. Now, they were, you know, they had different caliber weapons. They couldn't speak to each other. They had different supply. I mean, they were, you know, it was a very uh, uh, sensitive uh, area. Now, right on that road, and their aim at this point was to get to Amiens, 20 k's from Villas Bretno. Villas Bretno sat across that road. And although the Germans pushed the British through Villas Bretno and actually to the back side of it, it was the great um, uh, 13th and 15th Brigade attack on the on Anzac Day, 25th of April 1918, that encircled Villas Bretno, pushed the Germans out, and saved Villas Bretno, which in turn saved Amiens. If the Germans could get to Amiens, they could virtually take the train to Paris. So the first thing is, and, and on my tours, I have four dates that I stress that people understand, and the German offensive is one of them, because so much happened for the Australians after that. The Australians were rapidly pulled out of the Ypres sector, down into to form a line from the Roman road, up to the Somme and across the Somme to the Bray Corby Road. Now, or really further north to the Amiens Road. So the Australians had this very, very important sector to stop the German advance on Amiens. And that in, that came to involve the fighting at Millencourt, Morlancourt, Dernancourt, and sully le sec and along the Somme, and of course, villers Bretonneux. So the first thing is that... Uh, by 25th of April, we were able to hold the Germans at Villas Bretonne, and then for the next month or so, month and a half, to really just nibble away, bit of peaceful penetration, and form a line between Villas Bretonne and the village of Hamel. Now, they're only three or four k's apart. So then Monash decides that uh, he would like to have his own fight. He um, gets permission from Rawlinson to attack Hamill and take Hamill. And he, and I won't go into the details, but he really creates a new way of, of attacking a German line. Now, we're not talking about the old um, lines of trenches and things like that. The, the war is becoming much more fluid now. There's crops in fields. There's you know isolated outposts. There's a lot of of, of raiding. There's a lot of um, um, peaceful penetration, as we affectionately call it. So Fourth of July, the Monash attack, given ninety minutes, 
They take it in 93, they take Hamill, they take the high ground at the Wolfsburg, and they form a new line. Now, the success of, of, of uh, Monash's new tactics were instantly and quickly seen by, the, by, by Allied High Command, the general uh, headquarters. And so come the 8th of August, those tactics were put in place. And then the 8th of August really through to the armistice was that time of pushing the Germans rapidly to the east. And that's, my book is titled The Last 100 Days. So it's that period. I mean, I do include... Um, I do include the uh, German uh, march offensive because that sets all this up. I do include the, you know, the Villas Bretno story, but it takes it through to the armistice. How important in this whole thing, so these last hundred days of the war, I mean, we call it the hundred days because effectively it was the hundred days that ended the First World War. That's right, yeah, yeah. Hmm. How important was the Australian role in those last hundred days? I think it's significantly important. Now, you know, I'm very conscious on your tours not to... I, one of the first things I say is that we all think we won the war. We didn't. We had five divisions. The Canadians had four. You know, the New Zealanders had one. South Africans had a brigade. I mean, we're nothing. In We've got 10, 10 divisions in... You know, the Germans have got 200 and the Russians have got 300, you know. The British had about 75 or something. Um, but... <sighs> We were on the eighth of August. We and the Canadians were at the um, at the uh, the vanguard of that attack. Um, Ludendorff very quickly called it the Black Day of the German Army, so it must have been a significant day from his point, the enemy's point of view. But we mustn't forget all the other launched the attacks that went right up into Ypres, and you know, um, Plume is still pushing pushing to the east and trying to you know force the Germans away from. Out of, out of Belgium. The French to the south are trying to force the Germans out of, you know, the, the Verdun, the, the, the Champagne, the, you know, the areas um, along with the Americans. So a lot of people were involved and it was a big coordinated push. The Canadians were up at Arras doing their bit. So we were important. We, you know, we punched above our weight, but I, I'm very cautious of, of overestimating our our overall role. It's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because I think for many years we blew our trumpet a bit hard and basically said mm. that we won the war. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, you know, that you poms would all be speaking German if it wasn't for us. And there, <laughs> yeah, was, there right. was a lot of chest thumping that went on <clears throat> with the Aussies. Mm. Um, then it seemed maybe 10 or 20 years ago to go the other way where we were trying to downplay the significance of what we'd done. And I think we potentially in that time went perhaps a little bit too far there saying that we didn't contribute. So, I'm, I'm you know, it's, it's, it's like a seesaw, this, is, this question yeah. of Australian yeah, involvement. Yeah, yeah. And there's no doubt that we have... Australians have often crowed a bit too strongly about our role, mm, particularly mm, in 1918. Mm, mm. But then again, it is also, there is no question that even General Haig, the commander of all the yeah. British forces, yeah. saw us and the Canadians as his spearhead troops, as That's his right. crack troops. He, That's right. And, you know, there was even the situation where he was um, trying to, it, it was very important that they, they kept information about the Canadians and the Australians joining the line because that was a big tip off that an That's attack right. was coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, I think it's interesting. We should be very proud, mm, particularly in 2018, mm, we should be very proud of this moving forward. For sure. Sure. Um, yeah. Because it was a very important time, mm, and, mm. And, and and I'm paraphrasing from someone else here, but it's been said that it was the uh, the only time in Australia's military history where we were the lead army on the lead battlefield uh, against the main enemy of the war. Right. So that's in, interesting. In, in other, yeah. in other, yeah, yeah. That was the only yeah. time that's ever been the case was 1918. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, important yeah. that we mm. remember that. Yeah. Um, and the centenary is a good time to be asking yeah. uh, all mm, of these mm. questions. You mentioned General Monash um, uh, in May 1918. He became the commander of the Australian Corps. Yep. Yeah. The largest corps in the British Army, um, and he gets a lot of uh, gets a lot of kudos for mm. the work that he did, uh, particularly at Hamel yeah. and, and what followed. Um, do you think Monash is all he's cracked up to be? I think I think it's a bit like um, Monash saw past what was actually going on. I mean, when you read about the, I don't mean the obvious things that we've learned about Hamel but about the organisation of lines of the, 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 the division of the ground behind the village of Hamel down to Hamelay and onto the flats, where there were distinct lines laid out for the return of 
tanks or the return of walking wounded or the or the up the, 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 the resupply by horses or the and he was such a meticulous man and so he's got the pressure of um, of common or accepted military principle i.e. Haig and cavalry breaking through and all of that you know I mean he's no doubt told that you know be ready for the cavalry you know make the break give them a give them a. so he's thinking outside of that he's thinking totally new tactics coordination of in a much more defined way he's got an engineering mind that's supplying him uh, detail that I don't think other people ever had and that's the brilliance of, of Monash um, I know he pushed his men really hard around, you know, Mont Saint Quentin, the end of August into September. But you can see his reasons. Um, no, I think he is a brilliant man, and uh, and I think when I think back of his background, he he didn't come through Duntroon or West Point or you know you know through military college. He came through engineering. He was a you know a, a citizen soldier. So I, I, I think his original thought is what makes his brilliance such. When you were researching this book, Will, and or the, the, the countless Australian actions in 1918, mm. I mean, the Aussies were just going in day after day after yeah. day, pushing mm. the Germans yeah. back. Yeah. Um, what surprised you in all of that? What, what stories came out of that, uh, that exploration that you hadn't expected, that you hadn't known about the Australians? I think, I mean, I'd always understood that this was the, uh, by, by 1918, the, the AIF were at its very best. But the comparison that you continually read, reading sideways, certainly with the Americans, and then the other side with British units, they just simply didn't. We had something unique, and I don't know what it was. Canadians probably had it too, but it was a a trust that comes through today in how if you go and talk to Afghanistan veterans, and I do a bit of talking among young soldiers and recent uh, service people, there's such a trust, a genuine trust in the man or woman next to them. They trust that that person will not flee, will not give up will not do anything other than what you expect them to do and that trust is like concrete it's really and that's what made us in 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 this period we'd gone through the disasters of Fromel and Bullycore and Pozier and now we had a great trust in our own in our own army our own leadership there was a trust in their officers there was a trust in Monash there was probably even a trust in Plumer and Rawlinson so I think that their experience, their trust, and their and the development of their own ways of doing things. I mean, peaceful penetration was so very clever and so well. I mean, we we, we sent groups to teach the Americans and the British how to do peaceful penetration, um, and 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 the, and the course of nibbling. You know, this idea of going out and putting a little post in no man's land the next night, putting another one on the third night, joining them up, and just continually nibbling at the German front, particularly around Hamel and, or particularly around villers Bretno and, you know, Morland Corps and across, across the Somme. And I find that intriguingly, uh, that trust in themselves is something that comes out continually. It's a, it's a very good point that you make because we often talk about, you know, the Australian Defence Force today can trace its mm. the roots and the way that they do things their structure, everything about them, we can trace back to the First World War. Yeah. But the truth of the matter, from my point of view, is we're not tracing things back to what they did at Gallipoli. And and you know, as much as we, as much as we admire what went on at Gallipoli, they really were a bunch of, oh, yeah. of, yeah, of yeah, yeah, enthusiastic yeah. amateurs. That's at right. Gallipoli. Totally, totally. Yeah. It, what, the, the 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 thread that links the Defence Force today with the First World War is what we did in 1918. We learned a lot of lessons which we took into the Second yeah, World yeah, War, yeah. Korea, yeah. and Vietnam, sure. and that carries on to today. Mm, mm, mm. And the other thing that I think is really fascinating about 1918 when you really start delving into it is exactly what you say the small unit tactics Australia mm, mm. fought a, fa- a fantastic war 
with these small units that could rely on each other. They had yeah. extra firepower because mm. of Lewis guns and trench mm. mortars. Mm. Uh, that these these squads and platoons were mm. just such cohesive units, and they could they could act independently on the battlefield. They knew what their objective was. They could act independently. They had the firepower to support them. They didn't have to rely on the artillery that was 20 k no, behind no, the line. No, 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 They could act independently, have enough firepower to get things done themselves. And that's what comes out time and time yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. And what that, what that did in nibbling their trench line 20 metres or whatever, they didn't need to go over the top and, and storm the German lines. They took it by stealth. You know, and that's a very, very clever. And as you say, this is independent units. This is 10 blokes or a, the CO of the 13th saying, listen, let's go and nibble a bit more. You know, not it's not coming from way up top. It's just where they're continually advancing the line cleverly. It's, it's really fantastic stuff. Mm. I'm looking mm. forward to, to, to reading more about it in your book. Of all these actions, is there one that stands out to you as the greatest Australian achievement in 1918? Well, August the eighth and the first day of August the eighth is pretty is pretty special. I mean, we took the three, um, we took the green, the red, and the blue lines within. You know, I think we're at the blue line by four o'clock or something, and and not only a bit of the bit of the blue line. I think we took the whole lot. You know, um, that's a special day. The taking too. I mean, Hamill's a, an obvious one. But, um, you know, 93 minutes, and in fact, new research is saying it was less than 90 minutes, so that's even better. But um, I also like, and I didn't know a lot about it, um, you know, the Hindenburg outpost line. I mean, that was some, some vicious fighting, but very, again, very cleverly done. Again, the British on our flanks let us down. I mean, by the time we'd established the Brown Line, you know, on the heights above the the Somme Canal, uh, the um, the uh, the Saint Quentin Canal, there, you know, the British are a mile back on our on our left flank. You know, we've got a very dangerous and exposed left flank that we've got to deal with. So, these are the things that are going to come out this year. Stories that I mean, no one go knows as you know. No one goes to the east of. St. Quentin or Mont St. Quentin, they don't go out to Joncourt or, you know, out to Bellinglis or out to the 4th Division Memorial, but that, hopefully, they'll start doing that. I think you're right. I think that's one of the most fascinating chapters mm. in Australian mm. military mm. history, and that mm. ground is, is, is really fascinating to explore mm. all the way up to Mont Brahan, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the last battle yeah. the Aussies took part yeah, in. Yeah. So I, I think you're right. I, I hope that uh, that 2018, I hope that books like yours encourage more people to get out there and explore it because yeah. it wasn't just our most important military time, um, you know, one of the most important times in our military history. It was also nearly the breaking point of the men in the AAF. They were just they were, they were being asked to do so much time yeah, and yeah. time again. Yeah, yeah. And the number of interviews I've seen with veterans where they say the hardest period of the entire war for them were the closing months. It just yeah, demonstrates yeah, yeah, yeah. how difficult it was for them in those yeah, conditions. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you come along across a lot of that in your your research for this book? I did, and the casualties were really high. And that's a sad thing, you know. You think eighth of August. Well, that first day we didn't lose that many, but and we got a long way. And and then the Germans started to put hold us and hold us, and the and the fighting got harder. And the the story really of Mont Saint Quentin, you know, is again an untold terrible story and we had you know great loss and suffering and you know when you read that the French had given uh, two weeks to cross the Somme and another two weeks to take Mont Saint Quentin and we sort of did it all in you know by seven o'clock you know Rawlinson hears at breakfast that it's taken I mean we did get pushed off and got back but it's these are unknown chapters. We've heard a bit about Pozier. We also, we know, I mean, we know about Gallipoli. We know, we, but we, you know, we don't know about, you know, August the eighth even, and and hopefully this year will illuminate that. Um, just one thing, mate. Um, you remember? I mean, you mentioned Mont Braham, the last battle that the Australian, the AIF took part in on the sixth of October, fifth and sixth. Um, but there are other units. The artillery carried on right through to the end. I mean, the last days of the war, the Australian artillery units. Um, the tunnelers kept fighting. First of all, the uh, the guys, uh, Oliver Woodward and his mates from the first Australian tunnelling company who fired the mines at the Caterpillar and Hill 60. They had an awful job on the 5th or 6th of November, in other words, four days before the end of the war, where they had to layer 
a prefabricated metal bridge for tanks across a lock under fire. And um, they, you know, the story of them having to cart up this prefabricated sections of, you know, heavy metal on 10 men in a line through the mud, slipping and sliding. I mean, if you drop this, I mean, it was a 800 pound section of steel um, that, you know, they had to then bolt together and put timber on and under fire, shell fire, and five Australians were killed. So... You know, no one knows those stories. Uh, you know, they all went home after Mont Brahan and they all went back, the AOF did, but there were, and, and of course the, the uh, Australian the squadrons um, 2, 3 and 4 were still fighting that air war, even on the last day of the, of the, of the I think on the last day or the second last day of, of, of November, uh, the 10th of November. So we were involved and there were still Australian losses right up to the end. Well, it's a it's an absolutely fascinating story of 1918, and it's going to be wonderful to read more about it in your book, and, and mm. hopefully your book plays a major role in, in, in spreading those stories and so people know more about mm. what we did in 1918. So, um, Will Davies, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Matt. A big thank you to Will Davies for joining us to talk about his upcoming book on 1918, really a pivotal year in Australia's military history. I think in 1918, Australian troops did just about more than they have done on any battlefield during our history. So I'm looking forward to commemorating them next year and also commemorating some of these enormous and very important battles that Australian troops participated in. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and keep up to date with everything we're doing, including some fascinating interviews we've got in the coming weeks and months. And please also visit our website at battlefields.com.au where you can learn all about our great range of tours to enable you to walk in the footsteps of the Anzacs. Until next time, thanks for listening.